Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Chicago online worship. I am Grace Latibadir Williams, a member of this congregation. I serve on the Board of Trustees as Vice President and I am Chair of our Good Relations Committee. I'm glad to serve as your worship associate today. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a community of children, youth and adults, a people of many beliefs and traditions, bound not by the specific list of things we believe, but the values we share and the mission to grow our souls and heal the world. Whether you are joining us for the first time or you've worshiped with us thousands of times, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. No matter how much money is in your pocket, no matter if you have a PhD, a GED, or no degree, you belong here. We are a people of many races and beliefs. We are a people of many genders and sexual orientations. All of you is sacred. All of you is welcome. You belong here. 64 years ago, the Reverend Christopher Moore came to Chicago as a grad student and passionate about making music, he took on direction of the church's small children's choir who met in the Hull Chapel to sing for the children's service before the adult one. He didn't imagine then, he couldn't have imagined then, the growth from one small church choir into a vast network of in-school and after-school programs serving nearly 5,000 students across the city of Chicago every year. Chris didn't lead the children's choir alone. He couldn't have done it alone. And the choir now has had more years without him than with him. But he articulated a vision shared by hundreds, a vision bigger than him, bigger than any one individual. A vision that would go on to touch more than 50,000 youth in the city so far. He wrote this, he said, I have been deeply concerned about this country and the world we live in. My way of attempting to help change it has been working with children and youth in and through music to assist them to a deeper understanding of the whole process of building and maintaining a culture that nourishes and ministers to its people. When dozens upon dozens of youngsters across the usual generation gaps and in ever-changing groups come to take responsibility for themselves, for each other, and their teams, and when that process includes the sons and daughters of classmates and others equally fortunate side by side with street kids, with those of every imaginable background and circumstance, and Nothing is of importance but the persons themselves and what they are about together. Then, then I begin to feel that there may be some substance to that American dream of the open society that we have so often preferred to mouth rather than to accept to live. We're so grateful today to honor the children's choir on their birthday. And even though we can't hear from them in person, you'll hear from them later in the service. Singers, alums, conductors, volunteers with the Chicago Children's Choir. Happy 64th birthday. Friends, I invite you now to settle yourself to take a breath. And as our prelude begins, to prepare your heart and mind for worship.
Today's worship will be focused on the written word and the spoken word, the ways that we engage with words and texts for our spiritual practice. Our chalice lighting this morning is therefore coming from our gray hymnal, the meditation portion in the back, one of our texts that we use every Sunday as Unitarian Universalists. Our words today come from Thich Nhat Hanh. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become holy ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us all and to all living things. Evoking the presence of the great compassion, let us fill our hearts with our own compassion towards ourselves and towards all living beings. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be the cause of suffering to each other. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life and of the sufferings that are going on around us, let us practice the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. Amen. I invite you now to join in the reciting of our covenant. The commitment that we make to each other about what it is we're doing here, why we gather, who we're becoming and who we are. Love is the spirit of this church and service is law. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. I invite you now to greet one another warmly in the chat box of friendship. Remembering it's public, say hello. Good morning. At this time, please have those who are young and young at heart join us for a time for all ages. Thank you. This morning, I wanted to share with you a personal journey of understanding that I hope will give some insight into today's service topic. The first time I ever read the book, The Giver, I was in the fifth grade. Now, many kids read this book in school, and for me, the first reading was something transformative. I can't tell you every detail of what spoke to me about the story, but I can say something about it opened my eyes to a million possibilities about the things I had yet to know, and I loved it. The imagery, the imagination, the science fiction elements. It was a story that brought me a love of reading. When seventh grade rolled around, I was assigned the book in class again. Oh man, I thought, I mean, I like this book. I, I even like it a lot, but I've already read this. I know what's gonna happen. Do I really need to reread it? 
Well, in this case, my teacher thought that I needed to, so I did. I really did expect the same story, but in the few years between my first and second reading, I didn't realize at all how much I had changed and how much my broader understanding of the world changed the way that I understood the story that unfolded before me. Familiar, but also brand new. Again, I won't regale you with the full synopsis, but this time the text helped me to better understand and appreciate the full range of human emotions. It helped me cherish knowing the truth about the world, even when it was sometimes painful to know. Those are important lessons that I have carried forward in my life in many ways. By the time I got to high school, I had come upon another Lois Lowry book, Number the Stars, and I so enjoyed it, I thought it would be great to go back and once more reread on my own, The Giver. I, just like every other teenager, thought I knew everything. This was going to be my third read, and you'd think, you would think somehow that I'd be prepared for yet another new understanding, but I was not. How could something seemingly static change so drastically? Well, first, I had again changed developmentally more than I could realize that change in myself, but certainly that wasn't the only process at play here. Each time we interact with a piece of text or media, our understanding of it is subject to change. Not only because of how our life experiences shift our understanding with time, but also because there is space inside of each text to grow. For example, knowing what came next gave me room to appreciate and better understand what came before. I could evaluate what each character knew and when. Knowing each character's personality helped me be able to question the choices that they made. On this read, I could even place myself in the multiple perspectives of different individuals in the story. I created new questions that I would have never asked before, and new answers also were abound. This unexpected shift here not only expanded my understanding of the text, but it helped me to grasp the concept that things I thought were static and would always be one way actually would always be changing. Up until this point, I had carried the concept that growing up was an end game and that somehow magically when you turned a certain age that you were a fully formed person and that's the person that you would be for your whole adult life. Indeed, the experience I had with this book laid that fallacy bare. This one book brought me a love of reading at age 10, an understanding of the breadth of human emotion at age 12, and at 16, swung open the door to my understanding that learning and growing never stops. Even when a book is closed, it waits for us to open it and discover something new inside, both about it and about ourselves. Thank you. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation? I offer these words from W.E.B. Du Bois. The prayer of our souls is a petition for persistence, not for one good deed or single thought, but deed on deed and thought on thought until day calling into day shall make a life worth living. Each time we gather for worship, we set aside a moment to expand the caring ministry of this congregation. Together, we recognize the cycle of life and death, the circle of love, compassion, and witness that is at the center of this and every sacred community. We stand at the side of parents and teachers and all those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children. We stand with those who live with grief or chronic pain, with illnesses seen and unseen, with mental disability or addiction. 
We pray for our neighbors in prison, those who care for family members in ill health, those who are struggling to stay afloat in the midst of poverty. Our lives are blessed by those who knowingly and with curiosity and courage face their final days. We pray for those in harm's way, be that across the street or across the world, from unfair legislation, from the dangers of known wars to the dangers of invisible viruses. In this season, many of us feel despair. The weight of the world heavy on our hearts, words of hope heavy and slow on the tongue. The prayer of our souls is a petition for persistence. We despair tyrannical laws, rulers and vitriol, loss of reproductive rights, brutality at the hands of the state, voter suppression and deceit, and we fear for the integrity of democracy itself. The prayer of our souls is a petition for persistence. And we come here where we can only be persistent if we lay down our burdens for just a bit. Breathe deep and know this, you are not alone. Your church community, your members, your clergy, we are with you. We are with you. We are with you. We are with you. We pray for the wisdom and strength of the leaders of the world and for the people of this congregation, as together we live into our longing to build a more just world. May the prayer of our souls today be a petition for persistence. I invite you now to type the names of those you would like to lift up today in worship, remembering that the chat is public. For all those souls, cares, and concerns that remain unspoken in our hearts, we pray. And that day calling unto day, we shall make a life worth living. May it be so. And amen.
During this time of online church, we here at First Unitarian have been continuing to find creative ways to gather in community, to worship together, and to nourish our spirits when we are apart. Last month, Reverend Terry shared with us how to make different kinds of home altars, physical spaces in our homes to set aside as sacred with objects that hold important meaning to us. This morning, we will be participating together in a spiritual practice that we can do in our altar spaces or in any space by reflecting on the written or spoken word. In Unitarian Universalism, we already have a practice of slowing down and meditating on a powerful or spiritual passage. We start all of our gatherings, be it worship or small groups, with a simple chalice lighting. As a denomination, we are not limited to just one sacred text, but instead recognize that there are sacred words of wisdom found in many places, be it the Bible, our favorite poet, or maybe something that we found on NPR. Our chalice lightings and readings encourage us to listen to a text with a new lens, one which invokes the spirit of church. Many of us have had our own sacred texts which have special meaning to us or that we would refer to as sacred for ourselves. Poems, books, and songs are all ways we can engage with the written word by reading it or listening to it and feeling a deep connection. Today, our spiritual practice will focus on engaging with such a text, whether it is a familiar one or something new, in a deep meditative way. This brings that spirit of church into our homes and hearts. And this practice is called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina, literally meaning divine reading, is a practice which dates back as early as the third century as a way to engage more deeply with the biblical passages through repetitive reading and silent reflection. Now this meditative practice is used by Christians and non-Christians alike to gain deeper insight into oneself through a new or beloved text. The process of Lectio Divina is four steps. Lectio, Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio. Or read, reflect, respond, and rest. For the first step, to read, you simply read the text and just let the words speak to you. This is not an academic reading of the text, not one where you need to read closely for the meaning. Instead, this is where you just listen and observe which phrase, about three to four words long, stands out to you the most. The second step, to reflect, is when we read the passage a second time, and then you specifically focus on that phrase that spoke to you in the first reading. After reading that passage a second time, you sit with your thoughts for a little while. You ask yourself, what is this passage trying to say to me? And you feel whatever emotions arise for you. This is not like meditations where other uh, where, where thoughts pass us by. And then the third step to respond is after the one final reading of the passage, you pray or journal your reflections or intentions about what spoke to you during this Lectio Divina process. And lastly, we rest. Before returning to your day, you rest and are grateful for what you have learned about yourself and about the passage. Rejoice in the sacred within you and your inner peace. In present day, Lectio Divina is used as a meditative practice for people of all different beliefs with all different kinds of texts. For example, the podcast Harry Potter and the Sacred Text he often uses Lectio Divina to reflect closely on one single sentence of a Harry Potter book. And this allows the host to experience both personal insight 
and a deeper insight to the characters and the story itself. UU Wellspring, an organization which leads small group spiritual practices, also has guides for interested UUs on how to engage with Lectio Divina for any text. This close and meditative examination of text is something that I have done in my own spiritual practices. When I also meditate, Lectio Divina provides a different experience and self-reflection than meditation does, because instead of trying to focus on clearing my mind and the silence, I instead am focusing on the words and accepting with gratitude whatever thoughts and feelings those words bring up for me. With each new reading, I grow more and more familiar with the words, allowing myself to go deeper into what they mean for me and my present context specifically. Oftentimes, what starts off as a simple reading turns into an experience which allows me to feel more deeply connected and grounded within myself. But you don't have to take my word for it. Today, we will be engaging now with the four steps of Lectio Divina, adapted from the work of Unitarian Universalist Reverend Tina Simpson. We will be engaging with the text that we use for our chalice reading today, the words of Thich Nhat Hanh found in the back of our gray UU hymnal. With each step, I will describe what we will be doing with each reading, with some time for silent meditation and reflection. If you are someone who likes to journal and maybe has some paper nearby, you are welcome to process your thoughts that way. There will also be times throughout this practice where you can share your thoughts, feelings, reflections in the public chat box. Now, before we start, I invite you to adjust your body to be in alignment in whatever way is comfortable for you. And I invite you to take a deep centering breath in and out. I'll now read our passage. And as I read this passage, I invite you to listen for what phrase is speaking to you. About three to four words, if you recall. And after I finish reading, there will be a short period of time for silent reflection. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become wholly ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being, common to us all and to all living things. So for our second reading of this text, I invite you to listen to the reading specifically focusing on the passage that spoke to you, the, the part of our passage that spoke to you the most. What are those words trying to say to you? Or what is this whole reading trying to say to you? Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become wholly ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being, common to us and to all living things.
So for our third and final reading of the text, we will be preparing to respond. So I invite you to listen to the words one last time before writing down a prayer or uh, journaling your thoughts and feelings in a reflection. Now you can write these reflections down on paper or you can write them down in the public chat to share with others in the community. That is totally up to you. And there will be time for silent reflecting or writing after I finish this reading. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become holy ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us and to all living things. Thank you for participating in that with me. As we transition out of this space through, through song and music, we will enter our last stage of Lectio Divina. Rest in the knowledge of all that you have learned about your inner self. Let us all rejoice that we were able to take this time in this sacred online space to grow together through the practice of spiritual reading together as a community. In these stressful and uncertain times, it is more important than ever to engage in practices which can heal our souls, engage our minds and our spirits in new ways. I hope that you will be able to use this practice on your own with the texts that you consider sacred or holy making church happen for you, not just here on Sundays, but whenever you need it in your own home and heart.
As Unitarian Universalists, we know the power of words from all different sources. May we all leave worship today with just another practice that we can use and another way that we can engage words to nourish our souls and in turn heal the world. Our worship has ended. Our service begins. May you be a blessing and be blessed. Friends, in these days of social distancing and online worship, just like when we met in person, the service happens as the work of many hands. It happens because so many people come together to make it possible. Worship leaders and musicians, the administrators, the committee leaders, our board leaders, everyone working together. The ministry of this church is not your ministers. We're just a part of it. The ministry of this church is everyone doing what they can for and with everyone else. And I end the service with a word of deep gratitude and appreciation for all those hands who make this possible. This community is entirely self-sustaining and self-funded through the donations from members and friends. Will you consider making a donation today to support the work of this church and keep making these services and our community possible. Thank you.